Welcome to the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church of Chattanooga. This recording is simply the sermon portion of our worship service. To experience our full worship service, we encourage you and invite you to join us Sunday morning at 11 in our beautiful sanctuary located at 1505 North Moore Road. The word of the Lord, Jonah chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the message I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about that calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you read the link that you clicked on to get to this sermon, you've probably noticed the rather audacious title of the sermon, The Worst Sermon Ever. As I was writing it, it seemed like the perfect title, but i got to say, right now, I feel some pressure to live up to that, or maybe down to it. Anyone can preach a bad sermon, and heads up, all of us have. But the worst? That is an accomplishment. Jimbo Fisher's 45-25 record at Tex- as Texas A&M's football coach wasn't bad, but the Aggie faithful thought it was bad enough for the school to pay him $77 million not to show up for work anymore. My son's working on his Ph.D. at Texas A&M in economics, so these are the sorts of things that we talk about. No school in history has ever paid any coach more to simply walk away. But don't let that obscenely large payout fool you. Jimbo Fisher may have been disappointing, but he was not the worst. That distinction belongs to a far less wealthy and far less well-known man named Watson Brown, who in 31 years as head coach at places like UAB and Tennessee Tech won less than 40% of his games and is now the proud proud, I guess, owner of the all-time worst coaching record in college football history. That designation, worst football coach, isn't just an opinion. It's based on a bunch of impressively terrible statistics. That makes perfect sense to me. But the problem is there aren't statistics to separate good sermons from bad ones. So who am I to say that any particular sermon is bad, let alone the all-time worst sermon ever? Well, Having spent four summers in school with people who were learning to preach and having read back through my own early sermons, and I am sorry if I subjected you to any of those, I think I know a thing or two about bad sermons. 48 minutes without making a single point? Trust me, that's a bad sermon. 24 minutes with 48 points? Equally bad and sometimes worse. No eye contact, no inflection, Bible verses tossed around without any context whatsoever, refashioned to suit the preacher's agenda while ignoring God's. All jokes, no substance, all about the preacher, none about God. I'm not even sure that qualifies as a sermon, though some people try to pass it off as one. I admit to you that I have preached my share of bad sermons, but the worst sermon honors aren't mine, at least not for another 15 minutes or so. This morning, that distinction belongs to our friend Jonah. The book that bears his name, all four chapters of it, is a story of a single episode in the life of this singular man. Jonah is a prophet, and like most prophets, he's a reluctant one, because being a prophet is crazy hard. Prophets end up in places they would rather not be, saying things they'd just as soon not say. Prophets get used to people not listening, not accepting the truth about their situation, not changing their behavior, even when God's judgment is literally marching down the hill right toward them. Instead of a handshake and a thank you card and a love offering, prophets get made fun of, beaten up, threatened, 
or maybe worst of all, totally ignored. How insulting is that to muster all your courage to declare God's judgment and then have everyone just walk right past you like they haven't heard a blessed thing. For a prophet, success means staying the course, sticking with the message, keeping at it, even when you get absolutely no results. It is not a job for the faint of heart or for anybody that wants to be liked. In the Bible, most prophets speak directly to Israel, but God is sending Jonah somewhere else. He's sending him to Nineveh, the capital of Israel's arch enemy, Assyria. Assyria has been tormenting, raiding, violating, and upsetting Israel for years. And pretty soon, they're going to destroy the northern kingdom altogether. So it's no surprise that Jonah doesn't want to do this. However, unlike Moses and Jeremiah and Isaiah, Jonah isn't having some crisis of confidence. Jonah, we'll learn later in the book, is reluctant because he's afraid God might just save those Assyrians after all. And that is the last thing Jonah wants. Jonah could walk to Nineveh in a month or so, but he has no intention of going there. Instead, he boards a ship headed in the other direction, and when a terrible storm comes up, the people on board say, huh, this is no ordinary storm. They're convinced that somebody on that ship has angered some god somewhere. They cast lots and they find their man, Jonah. Yep, he says, I'm the one. I'm on the run from Yahweh. Throw me overboard and the rest of you will be just fine. To their credit, his fellow passengers don't really want to do this, but he insists, so they do. Jonah seems fairly cavalier about his own death. I guess drowning in a storm beats preaching to Nineveh. But Jonah, as you all know, does not drown. Instead, he spends three days in the belly of a great fish. Over the course of those three disgusting, terrifying, totally disorienting days, Jonah suddenly finds his voice and spends time praying, praising, and making a few promises to God. And then the great fish vomits Jonah out onto dry land. And as soon as his feet hit the sand, the text tells us that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Boy, God does not give up on us, even when we do. And guess what God says? Get up, go to Nineveh. And guess who still doesn't want to go? Jonah is soaking wet. There are chunks of fish vomit in his hair. He has not seen the light of day or had a breath of fresh air in 72 hours. Although Jonah might be tempted to crawl back into that fish's belly, he's no fool. So our hero, if you can call him that, sets off for Nineveh at last, walks about a third of the way into the city and delivers what is surely the worst sermon ever. Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then he turns and walks away. Our boy Jonah spent three days in a fish belly and an entire month on the road to say this? That's it? No prayer? No call for people to gather around to hear this message from God? No introduction? No clues as to who he is or where he came from or why he's here or how he got there? No funny joke or cute story or football reference to bridge the gap between his audience's lives and the message he's about to deliver. No repeat, repeated phrases that turn preaching into poetry. No three points to help us all remember it. No, here's what you're doing wrong, let alone any talk of how the people could make it right. No, nothing, not even a mention of God. Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I imagine him rehearsing it, refining it as he walked toward the city he hated. Which word should I emphasize, 40 or more? Is it 40 days more or 40 days more? Should I pause after I say Nineveh for dramatic effect? Like 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Do I shout? Should I just whisper? Should I make eye contact with anybody at all? In Hebrew, the whole thing is only five words, so I suppose it doesn't matter much. And anyway, anyone with half a brain can see that Nineveh is doomed. Nobody deserves divine judgment and complete and utter destruction more than they do. That's pretty harsh. But before we judge Jonah for being so judgy, let's be honest. 
Isn't there someone you'd love to say that to? Isn't there a part of you and me that would really enjoy pronouncing God's decisive judgment, complete with a specific timeline on our enemy? Forty days, and the clock starts now. This is Jonah's mic drop moment. He preached a hellfire and brimstone message. Now let's see some hellfire and brimstone. But the most amazing thing happens. An unheard of thing, really. They listen. The Ninevites listen. Every single person, every soldier, every bureaucrat, every mother, every child, every businessman, every farmer, every servant, every prostitute, every slave, even the king declares, every animal, they all repent of their sins. They all recognize God's voice in Jonah's terrible sermon and realize they need to make some serious changes right here and right now. The entire city fasts. The entire city goes into mourning. There is not enough sackcloth and ashes to go around. This is an altar call for the ages, the likes of which not even Billy Graham ever saw. Jonah has just preached the worst sermon ever, but somehow his stats, if you can call them that, are incredible. And Jonah? Jonah's miserable. Perhaps the most miserable believer in all of Scripture. He hates every second of this. He is angry at God, whining and complaining about the same sort of mercy he was praising God for back in the belly of that fish. Jonah's sermon has worked and Jonah is appalled. It works despite Jonah's bad attitude, despite his own hard heart, despite his reluctance to be there and his disobedience in getting there, despite his eagerness to see this whole city burn to the ground. It works. It works for the same reason any sermon, no matter how good or bad, works. It works because of God. This short book bears Jonah's name, but it's really the story of God more than the story of Jonah. Although we learn a little bit about Jonah's life, none of it particularly flattering, we learn a whole lot more about God's character. In fact, 39 of the 44 verses mention God. I hope you'll take some time this afternoon to read the entire book. It won't take long. And when you do, I hope you'll pay attention to all the things God does. In fact, humor me, make a little list. It's impressive. God calls, God sends, God acts, God provides, God forgives, God relents, God rescues, God saves. And then after you've made that list, I hope you'll spend a little time thinking about your own Ninevites, that person or group of people you love to hate, the ones whose punishment you daydream about, whose destruction or downfall or at least public embarrassment would totally make your day. Much to Jonah's surprise, and maybe our own, not even the Ninevites are beyond the reach of God's gracious salvation. What on earth is God trying to tell us in this cautionary outlandish tale of Jonah in his terrible sermon? The goal of good preaching is always change. Salvation, repentance, transformation, replacing old sinful habits with new righteous ones, softening our hearts and strengthening our faith, opening our closed minds, moving us up and out of our comfortable places, turning our focus away from what we want and toward what our neighbors need, making us more like Christ in all we do and all we say. The goal of all good preaching is change. Jonah's testimony on that ship in the storm and his sermon in that city he hated changed the sailors, the Ninevites, and probably that fish too. Even God relents from his planned destruction and spares Nineveh. The only character in the book of Jonah who doesn't change is Jonah. God help us. Let's not be like Jonah. Thank you for joining us for this message 
from the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Once more, we hope you'll join us in person Sunday at 11 a.m. for worship.